month, NASM is giving you free courses. That's right, free courses each month just for being part of the NASM family. Learn about everything ranging from nutrition to strength, weight loss to stress relief, and everything in between. Click the link in the bio for information and to claim your free course before they're gone. Hello, friends, and welcome to our Strong Mind, Strong Body podcast. I'm your host, Angie Miller, and today we are going to talk about imposter syndrome. If you have ever felt like you weren't good enough for a title or a position, or maybe you were so ridden with self-doubt that you walked away from opportunity, you have probably experienced imposter syndrome. I think it's much more common out there than we realize. Maybe we just never gave it a name. But I have a wonderful friend and expert out there who loves to talk about imposter syndrome. And I sought him out specifically to cover this topic. His name is Dr. Brian Price, and he is a retired Lieutenant Colonel in the army. He formerly taught at West Point and he owns top mental game where he works with athletes and leaders and helps them overcome imposter syndrome. And I figure if Brian can help athletes and leaders overcome imposter syndrome, he can help you and me. So welcome, Brian. How are you today? Hi, Angie. It's so great to be on with you today. Thanks for having me. Yes, I am very excited. And where are you uh, podcasting from or broadcasting from? Where? Yeah, are you today? so I'm reporting live from Seagirt, New Jersey, uh, down the Jersey Shore. Okay, awesome. I'm reporting live from Charlotte, North Carolina, and I just heard some big boom booms out there. So we <laughs> might get interrupted by a few strikes of lightning. Okay, it's been pretty vicious out there. So, you know, Brian, I would love to just open up with you inviting us into the world of imposter syndrome, because some people might be saying, I'm not really sure what it is. Obviously, it's about self-doubt. It's about um, feeling like I'm not good enough or something, but explain imposter syndrome to us. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a really big technical term, but it's an affliction that is internal that I think we all have either faced in our lifetime at one point or another. And if you uh, are one of the the few that hasn't uh, been impacted by it, you certainly know somebody uh, who has. So it's that feeling that if you've ever felt like you don't belong or that you're going to be found out that you are a fraud, you've you've experienced imposter syndrome. If you feel like all the successes that you've had, whether it's in business or in athletics or in whatever your professional field is, if you attribute those successes to external factors like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the things like uh, you outside factors, right? Uh, so uh, timing, those sorts of things. Versus if you are in, if you're not suffering from the imposter syndrome, then you're going to attribute those things to talent, skill, or hard work. So all these things, all these things kind of take place in terms of how we, how we view imposter syndrome. Sorry, sorry, I was a little bit muddled there. I just had a big bang outside. You know what? I totally get it. My brain gets very readily hijacked. So when somebody else's brain gets hijacked, I'm like, yes, I can relate to that. But really what I heard you say was if you're a person who um, I loved how you worded that. You said you're so afraid that you're going to be found out that you're a fraud. You know, you go through your day to day job, like looking over your shoulder, like what if they discover I really don't know what I'm doing? And I feel like all of us have had that experience before. We're like, where we're like, what if they, what if they figure out that I'm scared to death, or what if they figure out that I don't know everything I'm supposed to know, as if we're supposed to be perfect? But you also said that. Even when you're successful, then imposter syndrome can creep in as, well, that's because I was lucky, or that's because the other runner didn't run their best race, or that's because the former person that they had in this job did a, a crap job. You know, instead of attributing it to these internal factors like, hey, I'm killing this job right now. Yeah. So, I mean, this essentially comes if you were going to get a promotion at work and you might subscribe those things to, uh, your luck, your timing, uh, other people's helping you out, and you see someone else get a promotion, you're going to attribute that to you know their talent, their skill, and their hard work. And it doesn't really work that way. Now, look, 70% of the population suffers from this thing we call imposter syndrome. And it disproportionately affects high, high achievers and high performers 
than than folks that are that are not as high achieving. It also disproportionately affects women uh, more so than men, or at least or it was thought to in the beginning. But it doesn't matter what profession that you're in; you're gonna you're gonna suffer these types of effects. Um, and what it can lead to is inaction, and it can lead to you not doing the things that you should be doing in order to progress your career. And there's some simple tools and techniques that we can talk about that can kind of uh, you know help us overcome this thing we call an imposter syndrome. Okay, perfect. So, you know, I jotted that down. 70% of the population is in, is impacted. And that's really interesting because I think that so many of us who've been ridden with self-doubt over different situations, you know, we pass up an opportunity or, or we aren't performing as well as we could in our job because we're so scared that um, we're not doing a good job. And no matter our successes, like you said, we're attributing it to these outside factors, this external locus of control, when really it was all about us and we have a hard time accepting that. But you also said that it disproportionately impacts women. And, you know, to be honest with you, that doesn't surprise me. It really doesn't. Um, I, I, I think that women tend to, um, maybe this isn't a global generalization, but that, yeah, just doesn't surprise me that women maybe have a little bit more doubt. And, you know, at the end of the day, what happens then with imposter syndrome is it leads to that paralyzing impact. Like you don't move then because you're paralyzed with your own fears. And fear is, I always tell clients when you're standing on a mountain of fear, you're making decisions that are more knee jerk, that are fear based versus opportunity and possibility based. That's a, it's a terrible way to make decisions. Sure. And I think, you know, where it might impact women in the workplace uh, sometimes more often than men is because, remember, it's that feeling that you don't belong, that you're somehow, you know, not there for the right reasons. And so in if you are a woman in a male dominated uh, industry or enterprise or profession, then you might not see a lot of you in the boardroom or at the CEO level. And so you might feel as though you don't necessarily belong, but you do. Um, and the downside to that is, it, again, it can lead to a lot of inaction and you not taking advantage of opportunities that are that are before you. You know, I'm glad you brought that up because actually the training industry was disproportionately male for many, many years. And often those who train performance athletes um, is still disproportionately male. Um, when I came on with NESM as an educator, as a female educator, I remember struggling with the imposter syndrome. And I think all of us, not females on the team did, because it was always a very male dominated team. And so you're right. When you're in a male dominated situation, sometimes you look over your shoulder and wonder if, if you actually do belong there. And I think this is critical for trainers to hear because it does impact all of us. And what I love is that you're saying it impacts high achievers even more. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's because as high achievers, we push ourselves further, stronger, faster. We know we want it. We feel inherently that we're ready, but yet we have a lot of doubt because it's out of our comfort zone, right? If you're not pushing yourself, you have no reason to feel the imposter syndrome. Yeah. I think where the, the danger is for high performers that um, do suffer from the imposter syndrome, the one thing is it's a motivating fuel for you to achieve more and more and more. But the downside to that is there is no ceiling. And so it can lead to feelings where you don't you don't appreciate and value the fact of, of where you are. Um, and that perfectionism, you know, sometimes imposter syndrome also manifests itself in how we receive criticism. So we all probably know high performers that are don't take constructive criticism very well. And when that happens, you know, those people are not necessarily fun to be around and it's going to be, you know, a limit. It's going to cap their potential at some point. I love the way that you said that, because on one side of the coin, it's very motivating. <clears throat> high achievers want to continue achieving. They're inherently wired to be high achievers to push to the next level. But at the same time, it can cap, right? Because um, you and I had talked about that tie between perfectionism and, and perfectionism can frankly make people very defensive because the way that they receive feedback is from a place of a defensive stance, a stance that says, well, hold on, you're questioning my innate need to be perfect at this. And I don't like this. You're making me uncomfortable. And so it can cap, it can, it can stifle people's potential. Per perfectionism does that. And I like that you link that in because I've always wondered how closely tied are perfectionism and the imposter syndrome. But even those people that are the perfectionists that are high performers, they have, you know, the ability to uh, perform at a high level, but they're always going to feel inadequate, 
right? So it's those high achievers that that feeling of inadequacy makes them internally, like externally, they look like they're achieving, but internally, uh, you, you know, they're suffering. And when you're and you're when you're like that, I don't. Th I think it's very difficult for you to give kind of your authentic self. Yeah, I think so too. I think that it means that you're out there giving it your best game, but you're not feeling the joy that goes along with it. I think that's really what I see it as, is like perfectionism can steal my joy. Um, Self-doubt can steal my joy. So I might be out there killing it, but if I've got these this, these icky voices in my head, then it's, it's taken away my joy. It's taken away my authenticity, my ability to show up as exactly who I am, just doing the best that I can. I want to reintroduce you, Brian. This is Dr. Brian Price, and he is the creator of Top Metal Game. He is also a retired lieutenant colonel in the Army. He taught at West Point, and he talks a lot about imposter syndrome, and I could not wait to get him on this show because I know I, for one, have struggled with imposter syndrome a time or two or three or four. And even though I keep going after what I want, there's those nagging doubts. And I really want Brian to give us the goods on what to do about that. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the things why I believe that imposter syndrome is so pervasive in our society, there's a, there's a couple of reasons. One is I believe it's in our DNA, right? I think we are, you know, are, we're built in order to see things in a negative light. And that's actually a coping mechanism and a survival mechanism to keep us safe and, you know, mentally coherent, if you will. It's the coping, the imposter syndrome is also a, a method in terms of preventing us from experiencing that cognitive dissonance where we have a belief and then we get exposed to evidence that is counter to that belief. And we don't like that feeling. So one of the easy ways to kind of cope with it is to say, well, I don't deserve to be here. Um, I don't belong. I don't deserve that position. I don't deserve that promotion. And therefore I'm going to remain on the sidelines. And that's safe because we, you know, that keeps our, uh, that cognitive dissonance at bay. Another mm. reason why I think that it's so, you know, uh, pervasive is just because of the society that we live in, right? You know, and I, I, it's probably a cheap shot to just blame it on Instagram and Facebook and social media. But one of the things that I think supports and reinforces and amplifies this uh, notion of imposter syndrome is seeing everybody else out there living these quote unquote perfect lives with perfect shots where there's no mistakes. And, and that can also kind of help you double down on your imposter syndrome as well. You know what? I love that. I'm taking all kinds of notes. And so the first thing that I wrote down is that we're built to see things kind of, um, I don't know if negatively is the word that you use, but you're right. It is, <clears throat> it is part of the stress response. It's a, it's a safety mechanism. It's a protection, right? If we don't expect too much, if we keep ourselves guarded, then we don't put ourselves out there too much. We, we don't create so much risk. I don't know if I explained that very well. And then you did a great job of explaining cognitive dissonance and then also the impact of social media. You know, it's interesting, even um, as a fitness person, when I go to post a, a, a pose, uh, I, I bet I take 30 different shots of that pose out of fear of um, somebody getting on there and saying, well, you need to roll, you need to pull your shoulders back or your torso is not long and extended or <clears throat> your head is not in line with your spine or that's not the best representation of the squat. And I think that it makes us pull away from, hey, you know what? I should have probably posted that because my body isn't perfect and it's not gonna execute movement perfectly because I'm just human. Let's see if this resonates with people in your audience, which is, you know, the imposter syndrome also shows up in those instances, like you just mentioned before you're about to post. And if you're suffering from the imposter syndrome, you might think that you, in order for you to post that on Instagram or in order for you to put that newsletter out, everything has to be perfect. And, uh, you know, what that leads, you might think to yourself, every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed if I'm going to be taken seriously. And sometimes you can take that to the point where you will end up not posting. Um, you see this all the times in meetings uh, where if you're in a meeting with others and you're feeling imposter syndrome, you know you have something interesting to say to that is going to add value to the conversation. But in your head, you're thinking to yourself, if I say this, what is John over there going to think of me? What is Sally going to think? Well, if I said it this way, uh, I'll get a different response from people. And when you have that, you know, that you know, two or three minute long conversation in your head and the conversation moves on and you don't speak, that you know you're limiting your value to your team uh, it, it, by by not you know actually articulating your thoughts when you should 
Whereas people that don't suffer from the imposter syndrome, and again, this is where there's a, a little bit of, um, you know, guys in some cases might be different from, from, from ladies. And I might be stereotyping the guys here, but like the guy that does not have that internal filter that doesn't care about, they just kind of put out their ideas to the world without giving a who, uh, who, what, who thinks of it. You know, those guys get the, their ideas out there, but they may not be very well formed ideas. And so your idea, which was going to really add value, never makes it out to the universe. I got to tell you something, Brian, sometimes I love people who don't have a filter. Like I'm sure. telling you what, sometimes I look at them when I'm in situations, meetings, or, you know, I look on social media and I'm like, man, in my next life, I'm going to come back as somebody who's like, woohoo, just put it all out there, baby. And don't give a second thought because, but you're right. What happens in, and I see that a lot. You, you see very quiet people. There's a, there's a, person, Dr. Stephen Hayes, and he, he invented or came up with acceptance and commitment therapy in mental health. And he was debilitated by severe anxiety and was a professor and would have to leave meetings and have panic attacks and would never be able to speak up. Now he's like 70 something years old, speaks globally, has completely written the whole, um, body of research on acceptance and commitment therapy. And, and so I just see all these ties between perfectionism, anxiety, and imposter syndrome and how it really does put restraints on us. It's like putting handcuffs and muzzles and locking us in and paralyzing us in our own place, which is really a shame because I think it would help for all of us who do have that tendency to remember, hey, guess what? If I'm ridden with this much self-doubt and I've made it this far, it's probably because gosh darn it, I have something to share. And so I should put all that aside and take a chance. So I love, I love everything that you're saying. And, and I think it's, it, it begs to be paid attention to. Um, and one last thing I want to say is speaking of having no holds barred, sometimes I look at the fitness stuff on social media and I practically cry. And I'm like, okay, I wish there were some filters out there on who's putting fitness stuff on social media and what you should do for exercise. But anyway, that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I guess I should probably point out, I should be very clear, like I do think uh, filters are good in certain situations, right? Particularly social situations. And I'm not saying just like, just put it all out there. But oftentimes I think that, you know, uh, when you overthink things and, you know, this happens to perfectionists, this also happens to people who are more introverted in nature. Um, and those things can really be amplified. And then your your voice isn't getting out to the world. Yep, absolutely. And I knew exactly what you meant. I tease my husband all the time. Don't tell him that he doesn't have a filter. Like the spaghetti strainer <laughs> is missing. And there's so many things that should not come out of his mouth that do that. I just look at him like, I, I know you didn't just say that, but you did. So, um, so now you got to pay the rest of the night anyway. Okay. That's another one. So let's get to the goods. Okay. This is Dr. Brian Price that I'm speaking with. He is an expert on imposter syndrome. He is the creator of top mental game. So now we've talked about what imposter syndrome looks like. We've talked about the change and the restraints that it puts on us. We talk about how it holds us back and all this self-doubt and why we might be passing up opportunity and why it makes sense that we struggle with it because, oh my gosh, we're high achievers. But Brian, the reason why we're here today is I need you to enlighten me. I need you to shine the sun and tell me, Angie and the rest of you 70% impacted, how do we get over it? How do we yeah. unleash those tethers? So, so this this is the fun part, right? Is you know, I we've pr been talking for about 19 minutes now. I imagine people have are kind of nodding their heads and saying, "Yep, uh, I know what you're talking about." But how do I get over it? I think one thing, it you know, one initial thing is to do kind of a, a self audit of what narratives have been important in your life. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when I talk to when I coach uh, business leaders, when I coach athletes and coaches. You know, oftentimes when you talk about imposter syndrome and the genesis of it, they will oftentimes go back to a an earlier part of their life when somebody was very critical of them or said something to them that has been rattling around in their head for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And sometimes I think those narratives can be uh, liberating, but oftentimes they can be limiting. And those those same voices pop up in your head when you are about to go do something that you want to do, but now you're being held back by this imposter syndrome. So I'll give you just one quick example on, on my end that you know uh, might resonate with people. I was an athlete growing up. I was uh, always very undersized. I was the smallest player on every single team that I played on. 
Uh, I was able to play three sports in high school, and then I went and played at uh, West Point and was the the team captain, played all four years there, was on the All-Patriot team three times, an All-Patriot All-Decade team uh, in the 1990s and 2000s to kind of date myself there. But a moment in my life that really kind of changed me in terms of this narrative was when I was going into high school, and I had just been voted the MVP of my previous league, and then I was going into high school, and I was I was feeling super confident. I used to practice with my dad on the high school field, and then we would go inside to go get a drink uh, back when you can kind of enter schools without any <laughs> protocols because they had a soda machine in there. So we pop in, and there's the janitor who I knew was a uh, very uh, prominent athlete in my hometown, and he says to me, um, hey, you look good out there. I just saw you hitting with your dad. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you're doing pretty amazing things. He's like, what grade are you going into? Are you going into sixth grade? And I was going to be a freshman. And he just was looking at me face value. But when he said that, I could have taken that at two different ways. I could have taken it as, oh my gosh, you know, my, my athletic career is going to be a mess. I'm never going to be amount to anything because I'm just going to be small and people are going to think that I'm way younger and weaker and smaller than I am. But I took it the other way. And my, that narrative that I took was, you know what, this is how people are going to accept me. So I need to work harder than everybody else in the room moving forward. So I think number one is do a self audit on those narratives that are inside your head. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it was a coach, maybe it was a teacher that said something to you and really get real with it. Number two. So, so basically sorry. what you're saying is you take that narrative and you get to decide how you spin it. You can either use it as limiting or liberating as you said. So I love it. Okay. So number two. Yeah. yeah. So identify what that narrative is and ask, is it hurting me or helping me? Like really, you know, kind of do the audit. Number two is I think it's okay to acknowledge the fact that you are feeling this anxiety for imposter syndrome. So what do you do about it? Your self-talk is, is part of this. It goes into the acknowledgement. And when you um, are going to acknowledge that you are being held back by this imposter syndrome and you don't want to chase a promotion or a position because you don't feel like you're entitled to it, ask what your self-talk is. And you know, I, I, I'll, I'll go into more details uh, l later on this, but it, your self-talk is either hurting you or helping you. And so if you see yourself as a, uh, a positive person that's able to do things, that has skills and talents, then you know you need to talk to yourself that way. Number three, and this is where there's a couple different techniques that are very uh, applicable. Um, it's if imposter syndrome leads us not to act, then the antidote to imposter syndrome is action. Now, I was listening to your podcast a little while ago when you were talking about the importance of kind of making your bed, right? We've all seen uh, the uh, General McChrystal, um, uh, I'm sorry, Admiral McRaven uh, bit from the University of Texas about making your bed and getting that early start. So if action is the antidote to the imposter syndrome, how can we act? I think one interesting technique that I use with my leaders and my, and my, uh, my athletes is one is let's get crystal clear about what your goal is. And how can we turn our goal into action? And this is a kind of a, a, a multi-step process that, that gets us there. Number one is what do you want to happen? And so for some of your you know, audience members out there, maybe they're on the fence about, do I open up my own, my own gym and start my own business? And they're feeling that imposter syndrome is preventing them from doing that. And so one is to say is, you know, take that goal and turn it into an affirmation in the present tense. Some interesting things happen when we say things, when we go from, I want to be a highly successful gym owner to I am a highly successful gym owner, right? So take it from the future tense of I want in the future, I will, to I am. And so you internalize that. Then ask yourself, what does a gym owner do? What does a successful gym owner do in these different situations? Would a gym owner uh, hem and haul over you know, two days over one Instagram post? Or would they get it to the 80% uh, mark and, and launch it? Would they uh, feel, would a gym owner not pick up the phone and call somebody that can help advance their career? Or would they, you know, get through that imposter syndrome and, and cold call it? And so by asking yourself that question of what does a whatever you want to be do and then act on it, you can get through the imposter syndrome. Here's the interesting part. It also works when you fail and when the imposter syndrome wins. So for example, um, if, uh, you know, let's say, on a Friday, you say you're going to call some individual that's really going to help advance your career. 
it's an important uh, business deal and you have to get it done. But the, you ask yourself, what would a, a successful gym owner do? They'd pick up the phone and call. But you don't you let the imposter syndrome win. When you wake up the next morning, ask yourself, I just failed last night, right? Like acknowledge that I, I, I failed last night. What would a, so what would a, you know, a successful business owner do now? They would okay. pick up the phone and call, right? And so that's one technique for, for people to do that. Another one is I believe it's important to find a person in your life that is a mentor or a friend that's going to be able to tell you the, you know, the business. I don't usually recommend going to your mom. You know, you were just talking about your daughter before, because sometimes as parents, you know, we can see the world almost through totally rose colored glasses. And so you'd want somebody that you can trust, but someone that's professional and that can help you talk you out of your ridiculousness when it comes to, uh, you know, this imposter syndrome. And then the last technique that I think is, is useful, I know I'm really giving you a lot here, so uh, we'll probably have some, some discussion after this, is to treat yourself like a defense attorney. And so what do I mean by that? If you acknowledge the fact that your imposter syndrome is holding you back and you recognize that your self-talk is saying you're not good enough, uh, you're, you're not smart enough, you know, it's really limiting your, your action, ask yourself to be a defense attorney. And what evidence would you bring to the table to counter this ridiculous argument that you are not good enough for whatever activity you want to do? And give yourself some hardcore evidence and some, some closing arguments. So, for example, if you have always been able to figure it out in the past, and yet you still have this imposter syndrome, if you've been able to achieve great success in the past, and yet there's another opportunity in front of you that you want to take, but you're saying, I'm not good enough. Go back to that, be a defense attorney and, and see what kind of interesting closing arguments you could make to get yourself out of this ridiculous notion that you're not enough. So Brian, that was amazing, actually. That could be, you know, just the tips to overcome. It could be a textbook, um, an article, a whole complete episode. And so I do want to recap because sure. these are really, really critical. And I think that it... it it begs to kind of go back ever over everything and sum it up. And so I was taking some notes and basically you, you started with the self audit. And so you have to start with um, what narrative has been important in my life. What was the genesis of this narrative? Was there somebody who gave me some information early on? And is that either, either it's going to limit me or it's going to liberate me? I'm going to recognize that this was narrative. And if I let it liberate me, then I'm going to recognize that maybe it didn't serve me or in your situation, you discovered, hey, people are going to see me as small. So I'm going to have to show them that small can go out there and get it on the field. And that's what you did. So it became liberating. And the second thing you said was acknowledge the anxiety of imposter syndrome. So acknowledge that you've got a lot of self-talk going on and that your self-talk is very critical. And I think that's really important to do that, to sit down with your self-talk. I've had so many people on my podcast who've talked with me about self-talk and the value of that. And I always tell my clients, you know what, what is that song that's playing over and over and over and over again in your head? That's your self-talk. And I want you to write it down because we need to claim it to tame it and we need to figure out what we're gonna do with it. And then I think the third thing that you said, um, was that imposter syndrome makes us inactive. Like it, it makes us, it keeps us stuck and it paralyzes us. And so what do we need to do? We need to do the opposite. We need to take action. And so one of the things that you talked about was making it a goal. And instead of saying things like, um, I want to be a successful gym owner. I am a successful gym owner. I have a, an interesting story about that when I was writing a bio years ago and I was sending it in to be, to do a presentation like a decade ago. And the gentleman who got my bio actually picked up the phone, called me up and said, um, I need you to change what you're saying in here. He's like, you're speaking about yourself. Like you want to be these things. You are these things. And I'm like, but I'm not anymore. I don't teach at a university anymore. And he's like, but you are these things. These are the things that you have accomplished. Don't speak about them as if you aspire to be them or that they are no longer you because you always take those experiences with you. Um, and then you talked about um, what would a successful blank do, a successful gym owner, a successful person who wants to present at this uh, leadership seminar. 
and then find a mentor. And your last one was probably my all time favorite. Treat yourself like a defense attorney. How would you defend the opposition? How would you get out your gavel and say, but if that weren't true, what would be true? Yeah, because oftentimes, you know, what's holding us back are these arguments, these self-imposed limitations that live in our head that may or may not be true. Um, you know, there's that old phrase of like, don't believe everything that you think. <laughs> um, and so when it comes to being the defense attorney, you want to, you know, if you're going to acknowledge that you're feeling this way, all right, well, let's get all the evidence out on the table, right? And let's see if we are able to come up with enough evidence to say, no, this is a ridiculous notion. You would never be able to convict on this um, evidence and material. You know, the defense rests and, and move on. I love that. You know, when you and I had a conversation, so I hope I did a substantial job of recapping, by the way. Did I do an okay job of recapping? Yeah, fantastic. I should get you with some of my students at Seton Hall to, to recap some of my lectures because you did a great job. Okay. I'm, I'm good at like the soundbite version, man. Okay. So yep. good. I'm glad that I didn't miss anything. One of the things that you and I talked about, you had told me that you teach people to separate their self-esteem from their trade. And I was so fascinated by that. And I, I would love if you would share that. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think it's uh, it's very dangerous these days. Uh, whether you know, again, you're you're in the business world, you're a student, you're an athlete, where you try to couple tightly couple your identity, uh, your self esteem with what you do. So, for example, you know, when people come in and tell you, uh, you know, uh, I'm a personal trainer, and they might go out and give a class, and it might bomb. Well, then if you have that tight coupling between who you are and what you do then your performance is going to impact your, your self-esteem. And I think that's a, that's a, a recipe for burnout. I think it's a recipe for, uh, particularly for athletes who, you know, later in life are not going to be able to, to do those things. They might suffer these identity crises. So what I, I try to do with my, my, the people that I coach very early on is I try to decouple that. I try to separate the fact of what you do is not who you are. So yes, you might be, I'm Brian, the baseball player, but don't say that. I am Brian, the awesome, you know, uh, husband, father, coach, teacher, professor, scholar, those sorts of things. But I also happen to, you know, coach athletes on the side, right? It's so you're, you're kind of separating these two. And if you don't, I think you're, you run the risk of when you do fail, internalizing those failures. And again, this goes back to the, at the very beginning when we were talking about the imposter syndrome, you are attributing the success of yourself when you suffer from imposter syndrome uh, to you know, outside factors, whereas you attribute the success of other people to their talent and hard skills and work. So I like that decoupling. I love that. And, uh, you know, there, I love that. And I, I love the whole concept of decoupling. And this is Dr. Brian Price, by the way, that I am speaking with. He is the founder of Top Mental Game. And he is our guest today talking about imposter syndrome. And this has been an amazing talk. I know I've really enjoyed it. One thing that I want to recap on that is that, you know, when you separate your self-esteem from your trade, I think that that would have helped so many uh how many people out there who lost jobs during COVID and all of a sudden didn't have their main identifier, but who are we as individuals, as human beings, as how we show up into the world and what we do is different. And I think that's the difference is it's the who and the what, what I do is different from who I am. And I think that that would, that would be really important for people to really consider. Okay. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I mean, you see it all the time. Um, and COVID was a great example where people, you know, the market changes, society changes, the world changed during that time. And that doesn't mean you're a failure. Uh, it means that you have to improvise, adapt and overcome. And if you're stuck with this identity of, you know, now I'm a failed business person, uh, that's not going to help you in, in, your, in your next venture. It also, you know, doesn't change. We can talk about this moving forward. If, uh, um, if I believe that action is the antidote to the imposter syndrome and you know, I believe that gratitude is the antidote to anxiety. And so that's, you know, that, that's another area where we can kind of uh, dive into the deep end too. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I had uh, the gratitude gurus on like a month ago and that's exactly yep. what they said is that gratitude is the antidote to anxiety. So um, I love that. I love that whole concept. 
Um, Brian, there is one last thing that I want to ask you before we go today. And by the way, I do want to say that what I really hear in this whole thing is whether you're a CEO, whether you are a business owner, whether you're a personal trainer, no matter what you are, you could even be a mom or a dad or whatever it is that imposter syndrome seems to impact all of us in the same kind of general way. And we can all overcome it using the same tools, right? We may feel its impact as an individual because we're human and we, we, the, the experiences that we have sink in with us differently, but we all can use these tools to effectively overcome it, no matter our position in this world, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I could, could not agree more. Okay. So the last thing I want to ask you is you also, you and I talked about process over outcome. And you said that you tell athletes to focus on process over outcome. And, and that I actually do a presentation on motivation. And I talk a lot about that. Don't focus on, um, I have to run five miles. I have to get through a one hour workout. Focus on the process of what you're feeling and experiencing as you're going through that workout. Is that kind of what you're talking about? Yes, with with a little, I think, um, uh, a tint of that, right? So, and I know you do a lot of motivational interviewing with, with people, so you, you probably see this uh, all, all the time in, in the folks that you're you're coaching. I think it's all too often we get wrapped up when you ask people about their goals is they want to fixate on the outcome, right? You mentioned, you know, I, I want to run a five minute mile, I want to run a six minute mile, um, I want to make this amount of money, and so I think what people they we're generally good at coming up with what I call outcome goals, but I think what we're really poor at is focusing on the process. And this also is a way to um, give yourself some armor uh, for dealing with, uh, you know, when you when you fail at something and you set a goal and, and you don't come up with it. And what I like to do is to to ask, you know, whoever I'm working with, leaders or, or, or athletes or coaches, is like, let's get crystal clear about what your goal is. And it's okay if your big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins would like to say, is going to be something that is an outcome goal. But then I like to get crystal clear on, okay, what is your process to achieve that, that goal? And what I really like to do with, with, uh, with folks that I coach is I say, okay, if that's your goal, what can you do today? What can you do to maximize your chances of achieving your big, hairy, audacious goal? Okay. And oftentimes... Oftentimes they will say like, well, you know, um, uh, maybe I can, uh, and they'll say something off in the future. And I say, no, it's three o'clock in the afternoon right now. What can you do between now and when you go to bed tonight in order for you to maximize your chances of achieving that goal? And so the reason is if you can stick to a process, and by the way, that also empowers the individual to come up with their own process, not the coach or, you know, the, the leader giving it to, to the others. It's, they're empowered to come up with it on their own. If they come up with daily and weekly things that they can do, when they put their head at, down at night, you know, and they've checked all their boxes, they know that at the end of this time that they've given themselves to accomplish that goal, that they've given themselves every opportunity in order to do that. And when you do stick to your process, and even if you don't come up with your outcome goal, you know that you've done everything in your power in order to get there. So you're not going to suffer those identity or self-esteem issues because you know you've kind of emptied the tank and stuck to your process. Okay. I love that. Of everything you said, I think I love the most just, you know, what can you do today? Today is all we got. What can you do today? So I love that so much. Dr. Brian Price, I am so glad that you joined me today to talk about imposter syndrome. I think that it was a wealth of knowledge for all of us. And even if we never really thought about ourselves as experiencing imposter syndrome per se, I think that all of the tips and advice that you gave can help us all go after our goals and show up as our best self, no matter what we want to achieve in this world. So thanks to all of you for joining us in the Strong Mind, Strong Body podcast. Um, if you didn't get to listen to our live stream, hopefully you catch us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts rate the show and definitely let me know if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes. So I will see you all later. Have a great week.